Um, I'm very pleased to, uh, to welcome you to the Aspen Center for Physics. My name, as many said, is David Valls Gabor. I come from Paris Observatory, and it is a real pleasure to be here in Aspen, in particular to introduce this free lecture uh, sponsored by the Nick and, Nag and Maggie the World Foundation. It's the generosity of this foundation that allows this uh, series of lectures, and as Emily was saying, this is the 200th lecture in the winter series. So it's thanks to the lecturers and to this foundation that we can provide you this cutting edge research. Explain science, explaining science to the public is quite difficult, and today we have a very good lecturer for that. But it is also part of our responsibility as scientists. I mean, most of the research we're doing is through taxes that we're all paying. So the least we can do as a scientist is to explain what we're doing um, uh, to the general public. So this week we have gathering something like 50 scientists, um, and this is just one normal week in the Aspen Center for Physics. And this building absolutely stunning because we have offices, we have meeting rooms, and you know, we are social animals. We have evolving three million years. We need face-to-face -face meetings. It's not Zoom, it's not uh, internet. We need to discuss, we need to argue, we need to eat together, we need to have ideas, new projects, new instruments, new theories. Um, and this week, um, Meeting deals with a very simple question. Why is the sky dark? When you will get out to the stars and in between the stars, everything will be dark. So the question we ask is, why is this the sky dark? Very simple question, very difficult answer. <laughs> and that's why we're here to discuss, okay? So today gives me very great pleasure to introduce Professor Roberto Abraham from the University of Toronto. Um, Roberto is characterized by one single thing, perhaps, is to be extremely original in his ideas. Um, you know Roberto since at least 30 years, <laughs> when we are on the other side of the pond. And um, when the first images of the Hubble Space Telescope, um, the new galaxies, very faint ones, had new ideas and how to deal with them. And at the time, it was completely crazy. Now it is mainstream, mainstream astronomy. Today, he's going to talk about another crazy telescope he has got an idea for and disco new discoveries, which are going to become the mainstream in a few years' time. So please uh, welcome Professor Roberto Abraham. Let me tell you a little bit about um, the sort of stuff that I've been, I've been working on. Um, so with a, as David has pointed out, we're old. And so I've been working uh, in this subject for like 30 years. Um, and I was pretty heavily engaged in some of the early work with Hubble then even more deeply engaged in the development of the Webb Space Telescope. So I was obsessed with Webb, okay, involved um, on the Canadian side with the construction of one of the instruments for this thing, and then uh, with uh, management and planning of it for the better part of uh, 15 years. Um, at er in the earlier part of my career, I, I got this bug to um, um, basically explore the most distant uh, galaxies that it was possible to explore from Earth as well as from space. And so I was involved in the construction of an instrument for one of the largest ground-based telescopes, Gemini, and that's the uh, spectrometer that I helped um, uh, modify in order to do a bunch of cool science that I'll touch upon today. And basically, I'm obsessed with telescopes. I freaking love telescopes, yeah. okay? I love everything about them. The thing I love the most about them is that they are a time machine, right? um, which um, what I uh, understood the implications of being able to see the universe evolving before my eyes as a kid, that just blew me away. Here I am, 58, I'm an old man, and it still works for me, okay? But there are certain elements of frustration, okay? And so that uh, recently, uh, I, I've decided that, um, you know, despite being, um, you know, engaged in all of these huge billion dollar class government sponsored projects, I'm kind of losing something because they're so expensive and they take forever. And um, I see these young people coming up at the subject. And um, I, I realized that if I was one of those young people, it would be me, you know, to see these projects that I couldn't really get my hands on and that took decades to come to fruition. So realize that sometimes it's better and certainly funner, okay, to be a pirate than to join the Navy. And that's gonna be a theme of this talk. So why am I so frustrated? Okay, why am I so frustrated? Okay, so I'm sure this is one of the few graphs I'll, I'll present, okay? But this one is special because what it shows is on the, the 
Y part of the axis, the size of the largest telescope that exists on Earth as a function of time. Okay, so it's time on the X axis and it's size along the Y axis. That's a logarithmic plot along the Y axis and this is a straight line, which is telling you that this is an exponential growth situation, okay? And exponential growth sounds pretty impressive, right? I mean, we've all, sadly, we've all lived through a pandemic. You know, when we were talking about exponential growth and the implications and how it's all super bad because it's an exponential. But the thing is, exponentials can have different times for growing, okay? so. When we were dealing with the pandemic, uh, when it was really bad, it was doubling every three or four days. Um, and then when we mitigated it, it was doubling every month or something, right? This is a situation where the size of the biggest telescope on Earth doubles every 50 years. That is crazy. Okay, we can do way better than that, right? In like 50, 60 years, we went from the Wright brothers to having, you know, somebody walking on the moon. So you're telling me that, you know, it takes 50 years for somebody to be smart enough to figure out a way to double the size of a telescope. I feel that's intolerable. I feel that's why you should basically, um, you know, aspire to more than having that, which is Galileo show, showing, I guess, the Venetian Doge something through a telescope. This, which is, uh, you know, a, a member of the largest class of modern telescopes. That's Gemini. Okay. We can do better than that. That's why I've, I've embarked on this piracy thing. Okay. So I'm going to tell you a story of how I became a pirate. And so with like with all stories, it begins with once upon a time. So once upon a time, the University of Toronto had this observatory, the David Dunlap Observatory. For about a week in the 1920s, it was the world's largest telescope. Um, but it was built, the city of Toronto, which is not the smartest place to build a large telescope. Okay, so um, this individual, okay, was my predecessor as chair of the uh, Department of Astronomy at the University of Toronto. That's my role at the moment. Uh, but this is a fellow by the name of Peter Martin. Peter Martin, he looks kind of like Gandalf the Grey, and he is sort of a magician, or a wizard, okay, because he figured out a way to turn that old telescope into huge piles of cash, okay, uh, through uh, a process um, wherein, um, you know, it was sold off and used to, to fund a new institute. And um, the, the the new institute, uh, basically, I was involved in the planning of this thing. At the same time, I did a bad thing, okay, which is I started reading books of philosophy. Don't ever do that, okay? It's it's way better to have an unexamined life. Uh, you would be much happier, okay? Because I started looking like this guy, okay? So this is Sir Karl Popper who wrote this book, okay? The Logic of Scientific Discovery, which is basically, you know, how to be a scientist. So Sir Carl wrote this book, and basically, if you read through uh, Sir Carl's book, he says, uh, you know, here's the avatar of scientists, okay? So this is Johannes Kepler, the guy that worked out that planets uh, you know, rot rotate about uh, stars in elliptical orbits, um, and the, you know, uh, the ethos of, of Sir Carl's book um, manifested in this person's life that what you should be doing with your life is you should be falsifying mathematical models. So there should be like a well-defined mathematical model, and then you should dedicate your life towards determining whether it's right or it's wrong. And if you find that it doesn't fit the data, you're like, it's wrong and science moves forward because you've falsified something. And I realized that isn't how I do it. That's not at all how I do science, okay? So if I have to have a stamp with how to do science, I'm way more like this guy. So this is Leif Erikson. I know 2024, it isn't that cool to be idolizing explorers, but I totally idolized Leif Erikson, who discovered America, you know, in, in Canada, by the way, well, in Central America, like you're told, okay, um, before Columbus. And uh, Leif Erikson's philosophy was to just basically, you know, discover things by looking in places that nobody's ever looked before. That for me was what made me want to get into astronomy in the first place, right? Because, uh, you know, I didn't want to be like one of these boring particle physicists, you know, who are doing it the Kepler way. No, you know, I wanted to be Leif Erikson. Um, okay, so at the exact same time, my colleague, Peter Van Dockham, who was then chair of the astronomy department at Yale, came to visit me in Toronto, and we went out uh, and we talked about this stuff. We realized that he felt exactly the same way. Okay, so Peter and I were old friends. We discovered that we felt exactly the same way. This is clearly some sort of midlife crisis we were both having. 
Okay. So we, we basically at that point determined that we were having a midlife crisis. We were going to solve it by going out, having a bunch of beers, making a plan. Okay. So here's the, the plan deal with uh, Peter and, and my midlife crisis. Okay. So we're going to spend a bunch of money. We just had this new institute and I was involved in the planning. So let's just say I could structure it in a way that it could help professors out who had good ideas. Okay, and so we were going to figure out a way to build a better telescope. We, this idea of doubling every 50 years, no, to build a better telescope. And furthermore, we are going to be both Leif Erikson and Johannes Kepler. Okay, so that doesn't sound that easy, and in some ways it wasn't. Some parts were easier than others. Okay, so being Leif Erikson in this subject is actually the easy part. Okay, um, because in astronomy, as I'll quantify a little more in a moment, you know, 97% of the universe is completely unknown. Okay, the stuff we're familiar with, you know, the atoms that make up this, this podium and me and you that we're breathing, you know, those are only 3% of the universe. And 97% is, you know, dark matter or dark energy, which we have not the first clue about. So it isn't that hard to launch off into the unexplored in astronomy. Because we know so little, so it's easy to be Leaf. On the other hand, it's hard to be Kepler. And the reason is because we're such ignorant doofuses about the way the universe operates, it's actually hard to have good mathematical models that predict stuff. And the theorists that come up with these mathematical models are really smart. And they're so smart, they don't like to be made to look stupid. So they make predictions in such a way they're actually hard to falsify because they don't want to look stupid, okay? So, let me try and explain this a little more. I'll explain the model, and then I'll explain why testing it is so hard. Okay, so 97% of the universe is dark matter, dark energy, we are 3%. Okay, so for the moment, we're going to focus on the dark matter. Okay, so the dark matter outnumbers the stuff made up of atoms, like 5 to 1. Okay, so the majority of, of, the, uh, of the framework explaining how galaxies form in our universe relies on dark matter, okay? So visible stuff that we're made out of is actually kind of an afterthought in all of the model, okay? Think about what I've just said, right? So the majority of the thing that we use to understand how galaxies form is actually invisible. That's why it's pretty easy to make predictions. If I, you know, basically with my kids, uh, you know, if they come home and they say, oh, yeah, um, you know, uh, an invisible person came in and drank all of the juice, you know, uh, it's hard for me to falsify that, you know, because uh, you can't see the invisible person. So similarly, invisible stuff is hard to falsify. But it's sort of a triumph, too, because in spite of, you know, the difficulty of all of this invisible stuff, you can put these ideas into computers and you can make predictions and the predictions look really good. This is a simulation, a huge chunk of the universe, um, starting from the time of the Big Bang. We're now like 1.4 billion years after the formation of the universe. Each of these little dots here, particles of dark matter. The blue is dark matter, pink is um, uh, gas and, and the stars, okay? So here we are 2.4 billion years after the Big Bang, and we can test these ideas. That something's about to happen at 3 billion years. Okay, so just wait for it, wait for it. What's going on over there? Wait for it, wait for it. Stuff is blowing up in this model. Okay, now I'm going to tell you guys a secret, right? Which is when this class of models was put out, they didn't agree with the data. So I showed you earlier a picture of me underneath one of the telescopes, and I'm like, I was involved in the construction of a thing to find the most distant galaxies. Since like 15 years ago, we found a bunch of things that shouldn't exist, okay? And because we found these things that shouldn't exist, these were massive galaxies in the distant universe, theorists then went, oh man, these things don't exist in our models. We better put stuff in so that things blow up when the universe is 3 billion years old. Okay, so now, philosophically, what would Sir Karl Popper tell me? Right? Because we falsified something. He said, you know... These galaxies, uh, you know, or should they be there or should they not be there? We went and looked, and the, the model was wrong. 
the theorist did not say, oh man, Bob, you are totally right. You know, the universe doesn't work the way we thought. No, instead what they said is, I'm just gonna add more stuff to my model, like blowing up galaxies, until I can get agreement with the data. So that should make you unhappy, okay? Because we shouldn't be able to just add stuff to our models to explain things other than say that they're wrong. On the other hand, though, if you look at the predictions of these models, they are a trial, right? You can put all this stuff into a box in a computer, run it forward 14 billion years, which is the approximate age of the universe, and you wind up with things that are just dead ringers for a galaxy. So that makes me think there's something to this, right? But it's unsatisfying. So, you know, I could make things that look like galaxies too using Adobe Photoshop, you know? That would be cheating. It wouldn't be science. Right? So there's got to be some sort of a compromise where you can make predictions and people like me can build stuff and go out and test them. But, um, you know, it has to be possible to falsify things so that you can ultimately tell whether or not the things that are being predicted are actually there. So it turns out that there are a class of things that you could actually test um, that are uh, absolutely foundational to this type of model. Okay, that is if you could look at galaxies in great detail, what you'd find is that they don't live on their own. Okay, galaxies live with other little galaxies around them, and little galaxies around them have littler galaxies around them, kind of ad infinitum. Okay, so it's a hierarchy. That's why this is called the hierarchical model for galaxy formation. So our own galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, we do have a buddy. We have the Andromeda galaxy, and the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy have a bunch of little buddy galaxies. And in total, there's about 75 of them. It's called a local group. The problem is, if you look at these models, at least on, on, on the face of them, there shouldn't be 75 galaxies. There should be like 750 or 7,500. There should be an enormous number of other galaxies that are not seen. What is going on? So theorists don't get stressed about this just say the observers people like me just too stupid know how to find these galaxies okay and they hide them it's pretty easy to hide galaxies so now i'm gonna have to introduce you to a slightly abstract concept called surface bright okay so the three circles that you see there okay have the same total amount of light so the reason that the circle on the far left is super obvious to you the circle on the far right is almost invisible is because of contrast. You're taking the same number, same amount of light, and you're stretching it out. So this is just a toy simulation. It's the exact same idea with stars and galaxies. If I have a, a galaxy and it's full of stars, it has, you know, a billion stars, it's super easy to detect if the billion stars are concentrated in a compact bit of space. If I spread them out over a large area, then that galaxy becomes almost impossible to detect the low surface brightness galaxy. Oh, all the theorists needed to do to say, well, we're only seeing like 1% of all the galaxies in the universe is to say that's because most galaxies in the universe are low surface brightness. You can't see them with your telescope. And so when you see that, somebody will say, you know, there's a galaxy there. You just can't see it. It's just too big. It's too low surface brightness. So that is the get out of jail free card that has meant that the theorists could predict anything. Okay, and it will be almost impossible to falsify. That is what Peter and I, in dealing with our midlife crisis, decided we were going to come to grips with. Okay, so with the course of the last 50 years or so, because astronomers are, are great at building things like Hubble Space Telescopes and the James Webb Space Telescope, we figured out to be about a factor of 500 better in terms of our capacity for seeing compact little galaxies. Webb is awesome. Stuff you read in the papers, nobody reads papers, stuff you see on the internet about web, it's all true. Okay, we're now seeing galaxies, you know, uh, 200, 300 million years after the creation of the universe, infant galaxies forming almost at the moment, the earliest moment it's possible to condense stuff out of the material of the Big Bang and form a galaxy. We're seeing them now with web, that they're compact and they're small. That's what our telescopes are capable of doing. But can you imagine what you would see if you could devise a type of telescope 
inspired by progress in things like cell phones that would allow you to see low surface brightness galaxies that are undetectable with regular telescopes. That's the goal. I'm going to do something technologically disruptive. <laughs> so let me tell you about the, there's only one telescope fact you need to know, okay, for understanding the nature of the disruption. Okay, so you cannot, like if you look at your cell phone, the, you know, there are three little telescopes in this thing, right? And there are three little lenses of different sizes. Um, now, the degree to which these things magnify depends on where it brings light to its focus, okay? So that's called the focal length. So you bring it to a focus here, it's going to magnify far less than if you bring it to a focus here. Okay, so these things in here are bringing light different foci, having little periscopes in, in your phone so that the light comes in and then it's brought to a focus at different distances. But there's a limit, okay, to the least amount you can magnify with a telescope. That is the, the closest you can bring light to a focus with any lens or mirror is half the diameter of the lens or mirror. Okay, so that's called the focal ratio, and there's a minimum focal ratio of 0 0.5. Oh, why should you care? Okay, so the reason you should care, because if you want to see big things in space, and remember, that's not what our telescopes are usually designed to do, big things in space, you want them to have a short focal length. Okay, you want them to be stubby. Um, but I've told you that there's a minimum stubbiness, right? So big telescopes are better telescopes but it means that you can't have a big telescope that doesn't magnify very much. All big telescopes have to magnify a lot, which means that big telescopes can, by their construction, only see small portions of the sky. So your telescope either has to be small, or if it's big, it has to have a gigantic sensor. So in this thing, there's a little chip. It's about that big, okay, and that's where light comes to a focus, that's what takes your image. If you want to have a big field of view, see a lot of the sky at once with a big telescope, that's the size of your sensor, okay? They're enormous. And every one of these things is an individual chip. So this is the um, sensor from a telescope that's now coming um, online in Chile called the Vera Rubin Telescope. It's awesome. You're going to hear a lot more about it over the next couple of years. But it's designed requires an enormous sensor, many, many millions of dollars, and each patch of the sky is covered by one of those little chips. That means compromise has to be made. Which is if stuff is big, you can't really see it well with that telescope. Similarly, it has to be really complicated. So this is a cross-section of that telescope's design, and this is a prototype camera for it. So what you can see here is that there's all of the scattered light and ghost images that prevent you from seeing big things in space. That's bad. But that's just the reality, right? There's nothing you can do. This at 0 0.5 law of the universe, there's nothing you can do about it, right? Well, not so much right. In fact, wrong. Okay? So, there's an alternative. Okay? So, don't use it such a big telescope. Okay? Now, you need to gather... A lot of light, little telescopes don't gather much light. They can have short focal lengths. So this, this little telescope, this is the king of the telephoto lens, okay? This is like what you're salivating over if you're a paparazzi and wants to take pictures of celebrities at Sundance, okay? This is uh, the ultimate a telephoto lens. So it's um, 12000 to $15,000, depending on when you choose to buy it, okay? And it's a, it's a fabulous telephoto lens. Its field of view, when you point it at stuff in space, is, you know, kind of comparable to the field of view of that giant billion-dollar telescope I was describing a moment ago. It's only small, right? And one is really going to do it. So there's a better number than one, okay? The better number than one is 10, okay? So uh, the technologically disruptive thing is that because people have been spending billions of dollars investing in the sensors for your phone, the sensors for your phone are now unbelievably good, okay? So they have, um, this is going to get nerdly, but they have, you know, read noise for almost nothing, which means that there's almost no difference, essentially no difference, between taking 
10 images of something and then digitally adding them up instead of having 10 little telescopes. You can make a fake bigger telescope using technology. A digital telescope is just as good as a bigger telescope, except for it's not stuck with this law of thermodynamics on the length problem. Okay, so 10 is a pretty good number. I think you'll agree. But you know, I kind of like 24 more than I like 10. <laughs> I kind of like 48 more than I like 24. The number I really like is 168, okay? So this is um, the, the big idea, okay? And it's called the Dragonfly Telephoto Array. It's located in New Mexico. And it's operated robotically. This is uh, the current state-of-the-art wide-field imaging telescope. Nothing on the planet can touch it, okay? For the niche science that I'm going to describe. So this is... Formerly, the uh, world's biggest all-lens telescope. It's the Yerkes 40-inch telescope operated by the University of Chicago. You might recognize this fellow over here. So um, you know, we haven't been building telescopes get on lenses for about 100 years in a serious way for professional astronomy. Uh, we made a move to having these big mirrors. These big mirrors scatter light. So if you want to do things at low surface brightness, you have to go back to the idea of the all-lens telescope. But this is what the current day largest um, all lens telescope fracture is, and that is 48 lenses okay, of the Dragonfly telephoto area. So when we hit 48, we were slightly bigger than the University of Chicago's telescope. Now we're the world's biggest. So when I say we, what I mean is Peter and me, but most importantly, the amazing students and postdocs on our team, okay? Because, you know, uh, if you look at the hundreds of people involved in the construction of those telescopes in Chile, the tens of thousands of people that go are involved in the construction of these big space telescopes, and then you compare what they've achieved to what we've achieved with a relatively small team, you should be struck by this thought. Those must be some pretty damn smart students. Hardworking, and they are. The you know I talk about the technology, but the real secret sauce to this project is the energy and the enthusiasm of the young people who are able to take Peter and my crazy ideas and turn them into reality, and uh, they're just awesome. And so, here's what a typical day looks like um, if you're working with Peter and me on Dragonfly. These are actual you know young people. Some of them might even be in this room. In fact. Here's one, okay, um, and uh, you know they, with their own hands, constructed the world's largest and most powerful wide field, um, you know, uh, imaging telescope. And we did it in almost no time, for as these things go, relatively little money. Okay, so now have uh, six of these uh, arrays, um, and here's a cute little uh, drone view of uh, of one of them. And the point is, is that you should think of Dragonfly to a conventional telescope like you should think about a drone to an airliner. Okay? And, that, and that was the nature of the technological innovation that I was referring to earlier. Okay? There are classes of problems for which drones are a way better solution than airliners. There are classes of problems for which airliners are way better solutions than drones. You would never cross the Atlantic on the back of a drone, okay? Uh, but for the things the drones are good at, they're way better than airliners. And we've only been building airliners in astronomy for 400 years, okay? Now we're building drones. So what do you do with a drone? What kind of science can you do? Well, before you do any science, first thing you do is you start making pretty pictures, okay? Because uh, honestly, you've got to inspire everyone, including yourself. So Dragonfly can generate pretty pictures for sure, okay? But that's not what really should excite you. What should excite you is that Dragonfly basically it hits different. There are things that Dragonfly can see and do that nothing else can do. Here's an example. The image on the right, so this is a big patch of sky, okay? Not a little patch of sky. This is a big patch of sky seen with um, a four-meter telescope. So a big telescope um, on the right, on the left, you see the corresponding image, the dragonfly. Okay, so what's going on? 
What's going on is that the big telescope, which is optimized for seeing small and compact things, the small and compact things is way better than Dragonfly. But for the big and diffuse stuff, Dragonfly can see, and it's utterly invisible in conventional telescopes. So here's another example. Okay, so uh, that's an image from a large telescope on the right. It's a corresponding image, Dragonfly on the left. And so what you're seeing here are clouds of gas and dust falling into the galaxy from outside the galaxy. And this is the um, uh, material reflecting the light from all of the stars in our galaxy. So this is like little mirrors in space that you're seeing. This is everywhere. Okay, you think you're looking at the dark night sky and that there's nothing there. But if you look with Dragonfly, tons of the sky, most of the sky is just covered with this stuff. It's called Galactic Cirrus. And we knew it existed before Dragonfly because, for example, you could send 1.6 billion euros. You can launch a space telescope if you're the European Space Agency. And the Herschel Space Telescope image the same patch of sky. And it is seeing this gas and dust, except it's glowing. Okay, It's seeing this in the infrared. So you can study the exact same thing. But you know, this is a 1 billion euro plus space telescope. This is, uh, you know, uh, two random professors and, you know, uh, 10 grad students uh, thinking differently about how to do this, and you can study similar things. And so this, don't get me wrong, this is really good. I mean, if you look at the scientific highlights of Herschel, it's spectacular. My point is, you can do it more than one way, that you don't have to do it that way. You can do it this way. And this went from crazy idea and a couple of beers you know, existing in like five years, right? So it's phenomenal. Okay, so that is a pretty picture, but that's not the most interesting thing that Dragonfly discovered. Um, so the, the main thing that Dragonfly discovered was that the universe is just filled with a class of galaxy, not quite totally undiscovered, but almost undiscovered by all other telescopes, which we named ultra-diffuse galaxies, and ultra-diffuse galaxies have now become a huge thing in astronomy. Like there are whole meetings that get, you know, in the Galapagos Islands dedicated to you know, understanding ultra diffuse galaxies, which were not a thing for Dragonfly. And uh, these turn out to be remarkable objects. Okay, so this is the discovery image um, that led to us pointing out that the universe was just filled with these things. Uh, so this is a little, these little boxes are zoom in showing this class of object, and this is what it would look like with a conventional telescope. So it's no wonder why these things were missed for so long. They look like little smudges. You didn't know if they were real or if they were a ghost or whatever in your image, but it turns out that they are real, and the universe is just teeming with them. So, ultra diffuse galaxies are now a thing. Okay, so what you should think of is like a conventional galaxy, and then throw away 99% of its stars. You leave it the same size. Okay? That's basically what an ultra-diffuse galaxy is. Like a regular galaxy, but somehow either the universe decided that it was going to build it up in place, probably the same size, but from hardly any stars, or the universe figured out a way to have a galaxy and somehow get rid of all the stars. Okay. We're not sure which of those two options is operating, but what I am sure is that we're having cool conversations about new ways to build galaxies that didn't really happen before we did this. So, um, let me tell you a goofy story, though, which is, uh, and this you know, gets back to the idea of testing models that theorists together. So, when we discovered um, ultra-diffuse galaxies, uh, you know, the first thing we did was we found a subset of them that appeared to have way too much dark matter. Okay, if you looked at the motions of the things inside of them that were moving so fast, you could weigh the thing, and it's got way too much dark matter. Theorists were like, that is really interesting and, you know, excited, but basically instantly accepted it. And, uh, you know, we're, we're building models to try and understand how you can have way too much dark matter. Then we found a subset of these that seem to have way too little dark matter. If you look at the motions of the stars and these things, they were going so slow, it was clear they had hardly any dark matter. And then it was a big furore with everybody saying we were wrong. And so, you know, this is the nature paper, you know, we published saying this. And then it was like, you know, they did this wrong, they did that wrong. It was like years of fighting, okay, over this. And I remember at the time thinking, how weird is it that when you say 
your object is just full of full of invisible things, everybody's happy with it. When you say, you know, it's just what you see is what you get, really astronomers freak out. Okay. Um, but in any case, you know, the, the last few years, we've spent a ton of time and the community has spent a ton of time investigating this class of object. It turns out that we were right. Okay, that the, the universe is just full of ultra diffuse galaxies. Here's a famous one that, you know, we then um, followed up on. This is an image taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, we've looked at these things with the Hubble and James Webb Space Telescope. I've never had so much time on Hubble and Webb, uh, and it's all because of a little telephoto lens. Okay, um, and uh, we verified the distance to these things. We look at the motions of the stars, and it is absolutely the case, okay, that... Some of these things are like 99% dark matter. Some of them are like 0% dark matter. That has been kind of revolutionary, okay, because it's forced theorists to, to ask fundamental questions about how you build up dark matter. And that has been thrilling, okay? When you actually, uh, uh, you know, build a thing with your own hands, and then you upend uh, in some way, um, you know, I, uh, establish ideas for how the universe works is the most awesome feeling ever. Well, young people in the room, you should contemplate a career in astrophysics because it is really great fun. Okay, so the latest thinking on this is that if you look at some of them, um, the uh, the arrangement of uh, of uh, dark matter free galaxies and the arrangement of conventional galaxies, in some cases they're conveniently in a line, suggesting that what's going on is you have a regular galaxy and another regular galaxy they smack into each other. Uh, um, uh, the, a bunch of stars and gas um, at the point of collision dark matter flies through that's how you wind up if a segregation between uh, galaxies with a lot of dark matter and galaxies with hardly any so that was pretty great okay but um that was yesterday's news okay so the appropriate question to ask after that was what do you then do next is this dragonfly thing's been pretty good but now lots of people are looking into low surface brightness galaxies to become a big thing in this community. And we wanted to do, continue to do innovative, new and awesome things. So unfortunately, went back, did more philosophy. Okay. So this is uh, Greece's greatest philosopher, Socrates. And uh, this is uh, Canada's greatest philosopher. Okay. Um, this is almost before you're allowed to become a Canadian citizen, they test you on this. Okay, do you know this quote? Okay, so uh, so Wayne, uh, the great one, Gretzky, said, I skate where the puck is going to go, not to where it's been. Okay, so uh, that's now such a famous quotation. It's become kind of hackneyed and used by a lot of people. But honestly, that's kind of how we live. And so let me tell you where the puck is going to go. Okay, this is another one of these numerical simulations, big boxes of the universe. Uh, this is uh, the distribution of dark matter. And this is the distribution of stars forming at the nodes of the, the, this dark matter. So you should look at this and, and you should say, wow, that looks kind of like a squash bug or but it doesn't look anything like this. Okay, it doesn't look like the stars. This is the stuff you see. This is the stuff we pick up with conventional telescopes, which looks nothing like this. So we're trying to figure out what's going on here by looking at this. Ain't good. That's bad. Okay. What you could do, maybe, is look at this. Okay. So this is the gas from which these things form. The problem is the gas from which these things form is transparent and invisible. Okay. Very hard to see. So it would be great, though, if somebody come up with a technique that would let you get this. Because if you could look at this, you would understand the geometry of the universe on its largest scales, and also you'd be able to figure out exactly how galaxies form because the story of galaxy formation is now in that gas. It's, you make the stars out of the gas, we can't see it. If we could see it, we could see it going out of galaxies, flowing into galaxies, building the thing up, could see the galaxies form before your very eyes, and we know where the gas is there because we have some techniques using quasar absorption lines. Don't worry about it. But anyway, we know the gas is there, okay? But nobody knows what it looks like. 
But if you go to your computer and you ask your theorists to predict what the gas looks like, it's hugely extended relative to the galaxy. So the galaxy you see will be its tiny portion, but the gas will extend incredibly far out, going into the dark matter in this thing called the cosmic web. So if you could see the cosmic web, you would see the majority of the universe's regular matter. You would see it take on the form of the dark matter. So you could see how the dark matter is building up galaxies. Wouldn't that be great? Okay. And if you could do that, you could also hold theorists' feet to the fire, okay? Because their predictions for what galaxies look like and how they form entirely depends on what's going on with this gas, which nobody see. But is that true? The gas is visible. It's nearly invisible. But if you're a half, plus half full kind of guy, nearly invisible means it's visible, okay? You just got to figure out how to see it. So it's glowing, okay? Now, if you look at the uh, surface brightness that you would need to get to to see this gas, you need to be about a factor of 50 better. What we can concurrently do with our, with our conventional telescopes that it sounds totally impossible. And the big limiting factor is Earth's life-giving atmosphere. It's the enemy, this content, okay? Earth's atmosphere also gives off glowing gas you got to somehow see this glowing gas from the galaxy and get in between the glowing gas and Earth's atmosphere, which is called air glow, which takes on structure and which moves. That's hard, okay? It's hard. But it's possible, okay? Because uh, that air glow is giving off light at very discrete wavelengths. So this is a tiny portion of, of a bit of wavelength of all of these lines which correspond to air glow. And this region of space here corresponds to the region in which that gas is glowing. It should also be little lines that if you could isolate and see, you could see that glowing gas. So the problem is with conventional telescopes for nerdly reasons I will not describe, okay, you cannot build a filter that has a narrow enough band pass with a big telescope to let you get in between these little lines. But you can build a little filter with a dragonfly array you can put them ahead of all the lenses, and you can tilt that filter, and then you can get in between these lines, and you can see the sky look really dark because it won't be contaminated by any of those lines in the atmosphere. So wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't it be great if you were a professor and you had really clever graduate students, okay? Take your bonkers idea, which, by the way, has a patent on it, okay, um, and actually turn it into reality by going and negotiating with companies, manufacture these filters, design mechanisms to tilt them, to assemble them in huge arrays. Now, my um, graduate students are phenomenal. Here's one of them, Deborah Lockhorse, testing a prototype of this idea in New Mexico. Deb uh, just won the prize for the best thesis in North America last year or work in this. So with a three lens array, nothing, okay? Three lens array, uh, we were seeing structure coming together around one of the most famous galaxies known, studied for like a hundred years. And with three lenses and this clever technique, seeing completely new things, stretching up well beyond the body of the galaxy, almost touching the cosmic web. So this is what we hope to see, okay? If somebody could figure out how to build an area of these things with hundreds or maybe even thousands of lenses, a conventional galaxy would look like this. You'd see gas extending all the way out, and you'd see other galaxies connecting to this galaxy via the cosmic web. That would be the largest coherent structure in the universe. It would be a magnificent discovery I'm trying to do it. Okay, so this is the timeline for us to construct what we're calling the Dragonfly Spectral Line Mapper. Um, this is done entirely using um, the hard work of grad students. My main contribution to this was to think of the idea and do a bunch of fundraising. Okay, but the actual work is done by all of the students. And it's almost ready to go. If I weren't here now, you know, we would be uh, commissioning this thing right now. Okay, so these um, two arrays are the original uh, dragonfly. Uh, these four arrays are the dragonfly um, emission line mapper, 
Uh, this image of the last one was taken just a few weeks ago. That's where we at, where we're at with this project. And this is where we want to be at. This is where Puck is going to be. Okay. So in three years, we want this thing to be a thousand lenses. We want to reveal the hidden universe. Okay. Stretching out to the cosmic web, seeing the largest coherent structure in the universe. And that, my friends, is why it's better to be a pirate than to join the nation. Thank you. Can we start it? Yes. That's right. So it's still impossible to see dark matter directly. You're still inferring it. Yeah. It's bad. It's a fact on things we can see. Yeah. So the idea here is okay. The the um, the Big Bang takes mostly hydrogen and helium, and it uh, you know filled space. Um, and the the dark matter, its main, its only way of interacting with that stuff in conventional models is via gravity. Um, and so you need something to collapse into the dark matter in order, and then somehow glow in order to make it visible. Um, so with galaxies, it's easy because of the glowing gas is dense and it's in the form of stars. The innovation here is that it's flowing into the dark matter. It doesn't have to be a star. It can just be the gas itself, the material left over from the Big Bang, coalescing into the dark matter. You see the radiation from that, which is extremely faint, but it is real. It is there. Yes. Is there a reason why you see the mass code like and how it can spread out the different lenses further apart? Yeah. So will you repeat the question? Sure. Oh, the question is, is there a reason why we chose to do this in New Mexico and uh, as opposed to spreading the lenses apart? Well, well I'm just curious. I'm also going to take these snapshot ones. Yeah. So I, it was mainly, mainly logistics. Yeah. Um, so as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, this was put together by Peter and myself and our awesome grad students and postdocs. Um, and it's just a lot easier managing um, a project where you could be kind of geographically lo localized. Um, but, you know, there's absolutely no reason why this can't be somewhere else. And I hope it is. Because this is just a way better way of building a certain type of telescope. Anybody can do it. And you can, as I've as we're sh as we've shown, right, you can start off small and you can grow big. So there are, uh, you know, many other places on Earth that would be fabulous locations for this. Um, Chile brings to mind is a really good one. So um, my hope and expectation is that Dragonfly you know, uh, basically evolves in a, in a direction where it can be all over the Earth. Could you theoretically put it out in space? Yeah, space Dragonfly is something we've talked about a lot um, because that's a, another you know big change. You know, the, this, this would never have been possible um, even 15 years ago. Now it just seems so obvious. Um, and I think similarly, and that's driven mainly by, as I pointed out earlier, you know, the innovations in sensors and things. Similarly, access to space is really changing. You know, because of, uh, um, you know, uh, things like reusable rockets, uh, it's not entirely feasible for, you know, a starting professor in my department with the startup we give them when we just hire them, build their own little satellite. So imagine that, you know, like a young, a young person you hire as a professor, you know, like, I want to build my own little space telescope. It's totally doable. Um, so that was unthinkable a few years ago. Now it's very thinkable. There are problems with realizing this particular concept in that model. Like, um, you know, part of the secret of Dragonfly is managing the data. So each one of these things has a little mini computer on the back. And they have to kind of talk to each other in order to work out best ways to stack the data. Um, and um, you know, the easiest thing to do would be to take the data in space and get it all to the ground. That is a pretty formidable um, problem of telemetry um, that hasn't yet, I think, been solved, but it totally will be solved, right? So we, we are indeed thinking about um, ways to dis deploy areas like this in space. It would be a good way to go. Not quite there yet. And if I were starting out, that's definitely something I would be looking into. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. How difficult is the digital processing of combining all of these small fellows? Yeah. What kind of accuracy uh, are you, is it still getting more and more accurate or? It's still getting more and more accurate. And if you do a bad job, make it look pretty easy. Um, so if you, if you, um, the magic of Dragonfly is that 
Uh, if we say it's real and we provide you with an image, everything on that image is real. Um, but it's also easy to just basically do a bad job of stacking the images and then hit it with Adobe Photoshop or some other tool afterwards. And you can kind of erase away all of the imperfections so it looks stunning. Um, but we don't do that with Dragonfly. So circling back to your original question, that part is hard. To have things that are really photometrically, monstrably stable, um, that's a, a big challenge. So what we're currently doing is our data processing is all being done in the cloud. Um, so this gets nerdly fast, so I won't uh, tell you about the details later, but that it's actually quite difficult. Um, and so we're continuously um, redeveloping our pipeline to make it even better. But the level of precision required is like 10x easily more than what a visual telescope would require, simply because we're looking at um, variations on large scales that are ordinarily ignored. So if you choose not to ignore those, you make your life quite difficult. Nothing you can handle because the technology is moving so fast with computation that it is a challenge. A lot of computing. Which, now, you mentioned adding that technology. Um, do you have plans to sort of open source it to different groups? Yeah. The, the, patenting, the patenting thing was completely silly. Uh, we did it only because Peter and I had ne never patented anything. We wanted to be able to lord it over our colleagues at the faculty club. <laughs> That's honestly, so that no intention at all to make money on it. And I mean, the, the, my question really is about, are you going to open source it to other people? Yeah, I, just philosophically these days in the astronomy community, it, you know, you pretty much open source everything and you ultimately release all of your data. And that's certainly our intention. So, you know, the original software, and this is a lie, oh, but um, you know, there's like a GitHub repo that you can go to and you can download the original Dragonfly software. We're not done yet that yet with the latest version. And that's partly because we want to maintain for a short period of time a competitive edge for these students. Um, but eventually that all will get made, be made public, raw data and our reduced data. Anybody who wants. Yes. What impact beyond academic do you see for knowing more and more about galaxy and galaxy formation? You know, that's an uh, awesome question. And in one of my roles um, okay. until a few years ago was every six, I was the president of the Canadian Astronomical Society and I'd have to go to our capital, Ottawa, and uh, you know, describe to politicians, um, you know, why it's, it's worthwhile to support astronomy. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll answer your question more ge generally, because it's not just Dragonfly, it's all of astronomy, the same thing could, you know, so why support it? No, so I, I think, you, you know, there are, there are lots of good answers, okay? So one of them is um, because the things that we're talking about here really speak to some of the deepest questions we as a species have been asking about since the dawn of time. You know, so astronomy is the really the oldest science. It touches on things like um, the creation of the universe, the sort of, um, you know, deep, deeply held um, religious things that uh, mean that people for the longest time have uh, you know asked themselves, um, you know, wh wh why am I here? You know, uh, what's going to happen in the future? And astronomy can touch on the, on those things. So I think that that's one reason to support it. Um, another reason to support it is because accidentally you, we, we make, you know, technological innovations that um, lead to, you know, uh, uh, progress in other ways. So, for example, you know, my phone here, you know, here's what I should have had. Um, you know, there's, it's got three, uh, you know, th this was long before your phone had, you know, multiple lenses. Uh, you know, Dragonfly had multiple lenses. Um, and so, uh, similarly, Wi-Fi, you know, the Wi-Fi in this room was invented by radio astronomers. Um, you know, uh, the optics was really, um, the essential elements of optics were done to try and understand um, uh, telescopes. Um, if you've had LASIK eye surgery, that's a byproduct of uh, research into adaptive optics. Again, it's astronomy. There are sort of these accidental technological spin-offs, and that's, I think, another reason to support it. Let me tell you the real reason I think and should support it. It's because we want to live in a society that's kind of technologically literate. Nothing inspires young people more than astronomy, except maybe for dinosaurs. So, so, uh, so when I would talk to these, um, you know, politicians in Ottawa, I, I would art articulate these three things. And the, the last one, I think, was the one that really um, most resonated with people because, you know, the, the doctor that you go to, um, the, the engineer that's building your bridge, in a lot of cases, their their love of, of of basic science that led them on those career paths, which aren't astronomy, is really space and dinosaurs. 
I, so that's why I think the paleontologists could do a better job of fundraising. Um, they haven't quite put it all together. Maybe a somewhat related question. A lot of my work is around societal and culture. It's a very difficult, you know, politics and yeah. culture and, and economics and so forth. And I was really impressed with your enthusiasm and the great presentation. I, I wonder in your work in Sodom and what we're doing, how do you look at the rest of the world? Do you find enjoyment, hope in your work? When you look at these other more difficult societal challenges, how do you compare and contrast those? Does that give you balance at all? I, I might be a little weird in this, but I'm strangely hopeful. Um, I think the best thing about being a professor for me is being surrounded by young, young people who um, you know, are there ostensibly to learn stuff from me, but I find I learn more from them. You know, they're, um, uh, they, the, you know, the young professors that I hire, you know, the, the first thing that, that they do is they figure out how to make um, the environment better for other people, how they can uh, help other people learn more by cooperating. And the old guard, the professors like me, I was hired on the basis of like being an egomaniac, you know, to build my own little empire to crush the other professors. Um, and, and so I feel that the younger people basically um, view the world through a different lens. And in a lot of ways, it's a better lens. Um, and so I, I'm hopeful because I, I see the world through their eyes. I, I also see a whole host of problems that I wish I could help more with. You know, um, the high cost of housing in Canada. There's not something I can do anything about in astronomy. I feel for them because that's a impediment to their, you know, their progress. So it inspires me to try and come up with original solutions to hard problems to help them come up with original solutions to hard problems that they're going to need in order to handle those things. But I do find it, if you're a youthful, uh, you, you've inspired me more than I've inspired you. Well, not at all. But too much you want to touch on that. Your students will bring that word. So you see that from their lenses, I give a day from, I guess, two more touching to that cultural key. Yeah. Do you see a big difference from your time and now? Yeah, yeah you know, I guess so. I guess so. That, you know, the reality is, you know, my students are from all over the planet, all different religions, um, all different perspectives, and they all come together to inform the project in ways that are great. You know, um, a, a, a lot of times, you know, we, we will hit uh, a roadblock, and the way through the roadblock is uh, just approach it in some way. And you never would have thought of, but uh, because of their experience, you know, one of them worked in a laser physics lab in some other country, and so they have some perspective that they can bring to the problem that the whole team benefits from. It's been awesome. Yeah, I'll I'll tell you, it was an accident. You know, um, we we didn't actively try and get a diverse group of students. We just a diverse group of students get involved in this project, get on board, and now everybody benefits. Counter is very diverse students. Actually, my first question, so one of my questions, and the first question was about uh, dark matter and gas. I guess I missed it. So dark matter is not the gas, or same gas. Yes. Yeah, I, I guess the question was, does the dark matter itself flow? Oh. You know, is it, can you see dark matter? You can't. Um, so you can see the effects of dark matter, and one great way to see the effects of dark matter is through this thing called gravitational lensing. And the um, European Space Agency has just launched a, a, a beautiful space telescope called Euclid. This whole reason for existing is to look at the subtle shifts in galaxies caused by distortions from dark matter. That's one way to go. And another way to go, which we're suggesting is a good way to go here, is to look at the subtle glow from the gas that falls into the very extended dark matter, we can see with our telescope that you can't see with a conventional telescope. I mean, gas is a different... It is, well, it's, it, it is gas. It's a plasma. So, you know, if you want to be very technical, it's a plasma, not a gas. But it's, uh, it's um, you know, the Big Bang makes mostly hydrogen and helium. Only a tiny amount of that hydrogen and helium is in stars. The majority of it is in uh, plasma in between the galaxies, which we figured out a way to see. All this, so, so you mentioned that at this, um, in some galaxies there's almost zero, in some a higher level yeah. dark matter. Do we know what it is in our galaxy? What the percentage? And then I don't understand what dark matter is. Kind of plasma or is it? Well, yeah, yeah. So your latter. Okay. So to repeat the question. Um, so um, 
Yeah, do, do we know why some galaxies have a lot of dark matter and, and some only have a little? And then the deeper question and much harder, and uh, it's an excellent question, is what is dark matter? So let me answer the second one first. I have no idea. Nobody knows. <laughs> yeah, you certainly get a Nobel Prize, probably I mean, multiple Nobel Prizes for whoever comes up with it. All sorts of ideas for it, okay, from exotic types of elementary particles that are um, incredibly light to, um, that's probably the smart money these days on um, uh, exotic types of, um, of elementary particles. They're just barely um, more than weightless, but not totally weight. But who knows? I have no idea. Okay. Um, and as for uh, what makes these um, uh, galaxies have much dark matter or too little, that's, I, I'm not a theorist, so all I can do is kind of parrot what they're telling me. And that is that there's uh, modalities of different types of galaxy interactions that weren't captured in the computer simulation. So galaxies that are uh, massive and are moving unusually quickly occasionally will smash into each other. And when they do that, uh, um, regular matter just stops dead. You know, it's like conservation of momentum. This thing you know, moves and hits this thing. It just stops dead. The dark matter flies straight through. So you pull it apart. So the dark matter is its own thing while the regular material just stops right there in space. What you're left with is if you form a galaxy out of what's left over of the regular matter, and you get a galaxy with no dark matter. Over here, you get these two big galaxies that are just not you know, than a galaxy and black matter. Yeah, well, uh, the, 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 um, <laughs> the, um, it depends on where in the galaxy you're looking, basically, okay? Because, um, where uh, the, the dark matter in the, in the galaxy is distributed in this thing called the halo, which is in the outer part of the galaxy. So, uh, in the inner part of the galaxy, it's dominated by regular matter, and the dark matter is in the periphery. And it, it's something like 10 to 1. Um, it's more like, uh, on average, over the whole thing, it's five to one. So um, every, for every uh, uh, particle of regular matter, there's five times as much dark matter by mass. It depends where in the galaxy you're in. Okay, number one, currently I bought on Star chips today. Yeah, huge. Uh, so the question is, how are we leveraging AI for this? So we, like everybody else, are um, impressed and uh, um, inspired. You know, things are changing so fast. We got to get on the AI train. So um, we're um, uh, using uh, machine learning and AI to try and do things like classify which of our frames are good and bad for stacking. It's not in our current pipeline, but that is going to be in our next generation pipeline. We're, we're using it to basically allow us to stack our images more quickly by removing bad uh, data. Um, we also want to use it to try and identify, I, I mentioned earlier that everywhere you look, it looks like it's empty space, but if you look in detail, it's full of this glisten dust called uh, galactic cirrus. We want to use um, the AI techniques to identify the galactic cirrus. We can identify the best portions of the images to look for galaxies in between the cirrus. And we're using some machine learning techniques to try and work out, um, this is getting people fast, but um, we, we have this Gaussian process model put together, to try and determine whether or not uh, some of the, you know, because we've got a huge number of lenses, some of them are working well, and which ones are working badly. Um, so the, the model basically can discriminate the good lenses from the bad lenses, then make the stacks better. That's just scratching the surface. There's so much more that can be done.